This is my update for Russian military operations in Ukraine for September 6th, 2022. We're at a very critical juncture. There's a lot of intense fighting taking place. Russia is moving reinforcements into Ukraine at several areas. Uh, so let's cover what's going on. Now, as I like to do, I go to the map. This is a pro-Ukrainian uh, live uamap.com. And if we zoom in to the Kherson region, uh, where the supposed Kherson offensive is taking place, you can see that there there are no there are no major changes on the map. This is over a week of fighting now, and Ukraine failed to make any advances. Now I've had a lot of people say, Brian, Russia has been taking months to make meager advances in the Donbas region. Uh, why do you expect Ukraine to make huge gains in just a few days? Russia is taking a long time to make advances in the Donbas region and, and elsewhere along the line of contact because they are doing so deliberately. They have an advantage in long range fires and they are playing to that advantage. They are systematically, methodically wearing down Ukrainian defenses as they do. They have uh, infantry storm those positions, take them, and then incrementally move forward. Ukraine does not have the ability to do this. They do not have the, the quantity or the quality of weapons to do this. They simply do not. Their only hope was to overwhelm Russian positions at a weak point along the line of contact. They identified that weak point along the line of contact as Kherson, and that is what they attempted to do. They attempted this broad assault across a, a very broad front in Kherson, multiple uh, concentrations of forces uh, driving toward Kherson, and the, the hope was that Russian defenses would fall and Russian forces would retreat and Ukraine would be able to make significant gains in territory uh, if not continue their momentum forward. And it was it was stopped dead in its tracks. Ukrainian forces around Kherson are now reverting back to the positional fighting that they had been engaged in before the offensive began. A lot of people say, Brian, uh, the fighting is still going on. Uh, how can you say the offensive is over? Well, there, there was fighting before the offensive started. There's going to be fighting continuing uh, long after the offensive failed. That is what we're seeing, positional fighting. And now it is true that there were a lot of troops that Ukraine gathered together to throw into this operation. And it was over so quickly, they, they didn't even manage to get them all onto the battlefield in time. So you have this extra concentration of forces that are going to be thrown into these positional battles. That, that is what we're going to watch. And it will be Russia, not Ukraine, grinding down Ukrainian troops in and around Kherson region uh, until it goes back to uh, the way it was before the offensive was launched. A stabilization of the front lines and then Russia, not Ukraine, choosing uh, where the major offensive fighting will take place, which uh, is, is in the Donbas region for, for now. I talked about how Ukrainian uh, planners, their Western advisors, how they had this idea in their mind that they would be able to overwhelm Russian battalion tactical groups, the basic building block of Russian military forces on the battlefield. Again, these, these are units between 600 to 1,000 strong. They have a huge amount of heavy weaponry, air defense systems, uh, engineering and support equipment. They're low on infantry. They rely on auxiliary infantry forces that, that they provide heavy cover for. And the idea was to storm Kherson across a wide front, overwhelming the battalion tactical group's ability to target uh, a, a multitude of targets coming at them all at the same time. That was the idea, it did not work. And I've said in previous updates that the reason this did not work was because Russia didn't just have a bunch of BTGs in the area. They had plenty of time to establish uh, very well prepared divisional level defense operations. That is what That is what we've watched transpire over the last week or so. And uh, just to give you an idea of how this, this idea of 
over overwhelming the BTG, how, how this idea has completely permeated Western thinking about Russian battalion tactical groups. I want to show you this intelligence update by the UK Ministry of Defense, and it says, Ukraine's offensive operations in the Kherson region continued over the weekend. On 5th of September 2022, the Odessa Journal reported 27 sorties by Russian uncrewed area vehicles on the west bank of the Dnipro, compared to an average of 50 a day throughout August. On 21 August 2022, Ukrainian forces reported shooting down three Russian Orlan 10 tactical UAVs in a single day. And these are uh, unmanned reconnaissance aircraft uh, that Russia has over 1,500 of. It says, in recent years, Russian doctrine has given an increasingly prominent role for UAVs, particularly to spot targets for its artillery to strike. UAVs can be vulnerable to both kinetic effects where they are directly shot down and to electronic jamming. The same goes for Ukrainian drones uh, on a much on a much larger scale because Russia excels at electronic warfare in ways the West and their, their Ukrainian proxies do not. Now, I've pointed out how U.S. Uh, military analysis over many, many years have, have said that these drones that Russia uses, the Russian BTG uses to find and direct uh, fire toward targets, that's their vulnerability. If you can attack across a wide front, they have to spread out their drones to try to cover all of these places. Uh, eventually, you could overwhelm their ability to, to target all of these, these forces rushing toward the BTG, and then you will overwhelm the BTG. You will cost them expensive equipment, and you will uh, compel the BTG commander to withdraw. Except that, again, this did not happen. If you look at the correlation of forces, as reported by the Western media, Ukraine at any given time on the battlefield has about the same number of troops attacking Kherson as Russia has defending. This is a one-to-one -one, uh, ratio. Usually when you're attacking, you want to have at least a three-to-one ratio. And as I pointed out in my previous update, you want to have a three-to-one advantage, but also with a certain quality of force not just a three to one advantage, light infantry going up against heavy armor, artillery, uh, long range weapons of every kind. You, you don't want to do that. You want to have some parity in terms of the type of forces and an overabundance of those forces versus uh, the defender. Ukraine did not have this. The UK Ministry of Defense continues. It says, in the face of combat losses, it's likely that Russia is struggling to maintain stocks of UAVs exasperated by component shortages resulting from international sanctions. There's no evidence of this. The limited availability of reconnaissance UAVs is likely degrading commanders' tactical situational awareness and increasingly hampering Russian operations. And I told you that was at the, the very heart of America's uh, concept of overwhelming the Russian BTG, which clearly did not happen in and around Kherson. They were unable to overwhelm the BTG. So uh, uh, they're saying, uh, likely, well, li likely is something you say when you hope that's the case. And as I, I like to say over and over again, hope is the first step on the road to disappointment. And if you had your hopes pinned on the Kherson offensive, uh, th 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 this was an exercise in disappointment. I want to point something else out regarding the, the failed offensive, this failed attempt to shock Russian forces around Kherson into retreat. Uh, the idea of Ukrainian forces rushing past uh, long-range fires from, from Russian BTGs and somehow getting behind Russian lines and wreaking havoc with armored units. Uh, I think this is what they imagined would have happened. Uh, I think I've, I've seen maps of, of analysts proposing that uh, Ukraine wanted to rush towards Nova Karkovka, which is east of Kherson. And it looks like they were trying to recreate, uh, in many ways, the conditions described in this uh, U.S. Army paper that I've gone over several times in uh, Armor Mounted Maneuver Journal, Spring 2017, defeating the Battalion Tactical Group. And in that paper, and I, I did not go over this the, the last time I discussed this paper, but there are several battles that are cited that took place in 2014, 2015 in the Donbas 
region that they were drawing these conclusions from. And one of them was the Zubrowski raid. The Zubrowski raid. And I, I, I think that when they look at Zabrowski's raid, they think that this was something that they could recreate around Kherson, uh, possibly surging towards Nova Kharkovka uh, behind Russian lines, operate entirely behind Russian lines wreaking havoc. This is what the paper said about Zubrowski's raid. In early August 2014, Ukraine's 95th Air Assault Brigade mechanized conducted the, lar the largest and longest armored raid behind enemy lines in recorded military history. The 95th was comprised of two mechanized infantry battalions, one tank battalion, and a battalion of self-propelled artillery. The brigade attacked on multiple parallel axes of advance and combined arms company-sized teams penetrated the thinly defended separatist positions and regrouped in the rear. Again, attacking across a broad front so that uh, Russian forces or separatist forces are unable to concentrate uh, heavy weapon fire in any one area. Again, this is exactly what they tried to do during the Kherson Offensive. The brigade then penetrated in depth along the two separatist region's internal border and maneuvered 200 kilometers east along the southern border of the Donbas. They destroyed and captured Russian tanks and artillery, relieved several isolated Ukrainian garrisons, and finally returned to their starting position near Slavyansk. They marched 450 kilometers behind enemy lines. And then there's a, a section with lessons learned from, from this battle. Look for opportunities to penetrate and inflict maximum damage. Even though the 95th was inside enemy lines for days, the unit consistently surprised enemy units, including Russian regulars. This suggests the absence of theater-level battle tracking, cross-unit communication, and a difficulty transmitting orders to create a coordinated response to the marauding Ukrainian brigade. The problem here is that... Uh, Western planners, their Ukrainian counterparts, trying to use this as inspiration for the Kherson offensive, are forgetting several important factors. In 2014, 2015 in the Donbas, there was no military aviation. That was not playing a significant role in the fighting. Whatever issues separatist or Russian forces had back then in terms of communication, I can guarantee you have, have been at least improved, if not resolved entirely. And... Uh, the Russian BTGs around Kherson, again, they had ample time to go from just BTGs uh, together in a single location to creating, preparing division level defensive operations. This is what they had time to do. Uh, and they most certainly had higher levels of battle tracking in and around Kherson, which means anyone attempting to recreate Zabrowski's raid under these conditions with Russian military aviation in, in full use now in and around Kherson, uh, this, would, this would result in catastrophic losses. When you are talking about thousands dead, thousands more injured, you're talking about entire brigades being destroyed, obliterated, removed from the battlefield. This is what happened during this, this push towards Kherson. This is why the offensive was a failure. This is why Ukraine has returned to positional fighting. So just another, just another clue uh, regarding where Ukrainian and their Western advisors are drawing their inspiration when drawing up plans for this Kherson offensive. Now, uh, because there's no Pentagon briefing uh, to go over, I want to use what's perhaps the next best thing. This Institute for the Study of War, it's a Washington-based think tank. Uh, their Russian offensive campaign assessment for September 5th, uh, 2022, right here. And their source is the Ukrainian general staff, Ukrainian uh, intelligence directorate, and many other Ukraine, official Ukrainian sources, as well as other Western sources. So uh, let's go over some of their key takeaways. Uh, number one, the Ukrainian counteroffensive is tangibly degrading Russian logistics and administrative capabilities in occupied southern Ukraine. Uh, so, what is their evidence of that? Let's 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 go a little further. 
As ISW has previously reported, Ukrainian officials explicitly confirmed that Ukrainian troops seek to attrit Russian logistical capabilities in the South through precision strikes on manpower and equipment concentrations, command centers, and logistics nodes. These counteroffensive actions also have intentional radiating effects on Russian occupation authorities. The head of the Kherson All Blast occupation regime, listen to the, the wording here, and you tell me if that sounds objective or not, told Russian media outlet TASS that his administration has paused annexa annexation referendum plans in Kherson Oblast due to security concerns. The Ukrainian resistance center similarly reported that Russian occupation authorities are abandoning plans for a referenda due to the ongoing counteroffensive. Shortly after TASS published his comment, uh, the administrator on Telegram denied he called for a pause because his administration had never set an official date for the referendum to begin with. Uh, and they're saying that this all indicates a high level of disorganization within occupation regimes that is likely being exasperated by the effects of the counteroffensive. No, uh, before the counteroffensive began, and, and even after it ended, there's been a concerted terrorism campaign all across Kherson, assassinations of uh, political figures, journalists have been murdered. Uh, you cannot conduct a referendum under these conditions. When there are rockets hitting uh, in and around Kherson, it, it's, a, it's a very difficult environment to conduct a referendum in. It's much better to stabilize the situation in terms of security and then hold the referendum. That, that is what Russia is doing. That is what they're doing. Uh, there's no evidence that Ukraine's military actions are hurting Russia logistically. There's, there's no evidence of that yet. Maybe they are, but I've seen no evidence of it yet. Uh, here's another takeaway. Ukrainian military officials maintained their operational silence regarding the progress of the Ukrainian counteroffensive, but reported on further destruction of Russian ground lines of communication in central Kherson Oblast. And again, this is something that they were doing before the offensive, uh, you know, officially began. And it's something that they're going to continue doing long after it failed. Uh, the report elaborates. It says, Russian forces are continuing to undertake measures to establish river crossings and maintain their ground lines of communication to northern uh, Kherson Oblast. Head of the Kherson Oblast occupation regime published a video rant depicting a pontoon crossing conducted, uh, constructed out of barges in the background along the Anatovsky Road Bridge. The footage showed that the pontoon bridge is halfway finished from the Kherson city direction. Satellite imagery from September 4th also showed three Russian pontoons and ferries operating west of Nova Kokhovka. And here's something that I, I have not seen anyone pointing out. Uh, the one area Ukraine actually did make some progress in during this uh, botched offensive was over the Ingulitz River. They they constructed pontoon bridges, they crossed over and they established a bridgehead uh, on the opposite end, uh, facing toward Kherson. Uh, they're using pontoon bridges. The Russian forces opposing them are also using pontoon bridges. When you have two forces that are using pontoon bridges, uh, in terms of logistics, neither one is enjoying any sort of advantage in that, in that respect. Uh, so then you have to look at the fighting forces in that area uh, being supplied on, on both sides by pontoon bridges. Who has the better equipment? Who's outranging the other? Then, of course, it is Russia. Who has the means of striking the enemy's pontoon bridges? Uh, they both have the ability to do this. Ukraine with their, their small number of HIMARS and M270s and Russia with their military aviation, their own mil uh, multiple launch rocket systems, their Iskander short-range ballistic missiles, cruise missiles, everything else that they have in, in abundance. They have the ability to strike at Ukrainian pontoon bridges, and they have been, and they have been destroying them. Uh, so there really is no advantage uh, for Ukraine in this in this respect, none at all. Now there may be forces coming directly from the Nikolaev direction and also near Visokopilia. Um, this is this is the, the furthest Ukrainian forces have gone south toward Kherson uh, without crossing the Ingulitz River. 
Now there's a, a great article here by Moon of Alabama, and it's titled Kherson Counteroffensive Zelensky is Going for Broke. And I, I will link to this and everything else in the video description below. The whole the whole article is great, but I wanna I wanna point out one specific part. The only Ukrainian hope is that Russian forces on the western side of the Dnieper can be cut off from the other side and then run out of supplies. The bridges across are damaged or destroyed, but Russia has enough ferries to keep the supply line open. Large river crossings are part of every bigger Russian military training event. It has the materials and troops experienced with it. That is why I have my doubts that the Ukrainian hope can be realized. And I, I absolutely agree with that. Uh, in addition to Russia being able to keep its own lines of communication open and maintaining these crossings over the river, despite the, the physical bridges being damaged, they're also targeting Ukrainian lines of communication. It's a two-way street here. Uh, so both sides in this conflict, they're, neither one is enjoying an advantage in terms of uh, an ease of resupplying their forces amid this fighting. Now that said, I've been listening to somewhat more conservative analysis by Alex Christoforou and Alexander Mikuris of the Duran, and their two most recent videos I will post in the video description below. And I think maybe their conservative uh, analysis is uh, the wiser way to go. Maybe I'm out on a limb with some of the things that I'm saying, uh, but it really does all hinge on Russia maintaining logistics for their forces in and around Kherson. There are these rumors of additional waves of Ukrainian forces coming uh, with numbers cited as high as 30,000 troops. Now, again, that does not afford Ukraine a three to one advantage over Russia or even a two to one advantage over Russia. Uh, they do not have any sort of equipment that gives them an advantage when fighting. Russian forces. So as long as Russia is able to maintain logistics to the forces in and around Kherson, they're going to be able to defeat these rumored uh, additional waves just as they defeated the initial waves. Now let's get back to the ISW report. Uh, it, it also says Russian forces conducted ground attacks east of Seversk, northeast and south of Bakhmut and along the northeastern outskirts of Donetsk city. So it's important to remember while all of this fighting is taking place around Kherson, Russia's main force is actually in the Donbas and it continues making incremental progress. And again, they're going slow because they have an advantage in long range fires and they are methodically destroying Ukrainian defenses, which uh, to be fair, are well prepared, have been built up over the course of uh, seven to eight years. They're layered, they're networked, and it takes a long time to wear them down to the point where you can assault them without losing huge numbers of troops. When you rush at heavily defended positions, you are going to lose huge numbers of troops, which is what we just saw Ukraine do uh, around Kherson. ISW also says Russian authorities continue to seek unconventional sources of combat power and are increasingly turning to ill and infirm individuals. When you hear ridiculous claims like this, you, sh you need to check the source of this claim. And luckily ISW uh, has a whole list of their citations, which makes it very easy to, to figure out where these claims are coming from. This particular claim is coming from the Ukrainian general staff. Uh, it's based on no actual evidence, and it's one of many ridiculous claims you will hear day to day since this conflict began. Uh, and whatever problems Russia is having recruiting additional forces and maintaining trained manpower, Ukraine is suffering on a, a much larger scale. The ISW report also claims that the Russian Defense Ministry likely is claiming Russian precision strikes on Ukrainian forces in Kherson and Mykolaiv Oblast in an effort to emulate Ukrainian strikes on Russian reinforcements and gro uh, ground lines of communication. But this is something Russia did since the very first day operations began in late February. Uh, they are targeting uh, concentrations of uh, enemy forces, assembly points, depots, warehouses, Ukrainian ground lines of communication everywhere. Uh, this is actually what Russia was doing leading up to this short-lived offensive. They were degrading Ukrainian capabilities as they were trying to stage for the offensive. That is what helped blunt it. Uh, so 
what are they talking about emulating uh, Ukraine? Until the U.S. sent HIMARS to Ukraine, they had a very difficult time striking at Russian ground lines of communication. Now they have the ability to do it just as Russia has been doing it all along, only on a much smaller scale than Russia is able to do it. Well, we all know ISW is Western propaganda. I mean, it, you could consider it the premier Western war propaganda in regards to Ukraine. And then you will hear these claims made by ISW repeated and work their way into the mainstream Western media. And it's very similar to how Pentagon briefings end up shaping uh, Western narratives for days or even weeks to come afterwards. So that's why I'm going over this ISW report, just like why I go over Pentagon briefings. So you, you can get ahead of these narratives before you start seeing it in the Washington Post, the New York Times, Financial Times, uh, Forbes, etc. Now, I know a lot of people still think that this offensive can succeed, um, but, but it's impossible. Barring a catastrophic blunder on Russia's part, it is impossible. This uh, long-term fighting that Ukraine now admits they are doing around Kherson, this favors Russia, has favored Russia since the conflict began, since uh, the initial rush of Russian forces into Ukraine, uh, up to Kiev, taking cities like Kherson, encircling Mariupol, from that point onward, it became a, a long-term, systematic, methodical process of Russia leveraging their long-range fires against Ukraine and inching across the battlefield. The only chance Ukraine had around Kherson was shocking Russian forces out of their positions. And they could have done this if they had uh, several factors working in their favor. They had the element of surprise. I mean, they were announcing this for weeks, if not months. Russia was well aware that this was what they were doing, and Russia prepared accordingly. If Ukraine had a larger number of forces, even if they were uh, using inferior equipment, but they had a much larger amount of, of manpower that they could put on the battlefield at one time, they might have had a chance of overwhelming these battalion tactical groups, the firepower of these battalion tactical groups. Uh, if Ukrainian forces were well-trained enough, within a brigade of say three to 5,000 Ukrainian soldiers, if smaller units within that brigade had the training to competently maneuver independently across the battlefield and overwhelm uh, the Russian BTG's ability to target all of these units moving independently of one another, that that could have been a contributing factor to success. But Ukraine didn't do any of this. N none of these factors were working in their favor, and they decided to launch the offensive anyway. This rumor of another 30,000 Ukrainian forces coming, what, what they needed to do was somehow channel, if they, had, if they just sent 30,000 in and they had another 30,000, what they needed to do was somehow get 60,000 on the battlefield at one time and send them toward Kherson. That could have overwhelmed R Russian defenses, however well pre prepared they were. And they didn't. They couldn't and they didn't. So sending them piecemeal is, is just feeding them into well-prepared Russian defenses. It is... Uh, for lack of a better term, it's suicidal. The Western media is saying that the Kherson offensive is over, that now it is, it's going to be long-term positional fighting that could take months to uh, achieve their objective of taking Kherson city, which is another way of saying they're not going to uh, take Kherson city. So here is Al Jazeera. Ukraine claims counteroffensive success to starve the Russians, and this is what it says. Taras Burzovots, a Ukraine special forces officer, told Al Jazeera that the speed of the counterattack to retake Kherson depends largely on when military equipment from the West arrives. So they're, they're, the offensive is already over, but they're, they're talking about if they're still to take Kherson, they need more equipment from the West. That is what they're saying. Currently, the armed forces of Ukraine feel the lack of armored vehicles for our infantry. We feel the lack of our air forces, which is something the US and its allies aren't even talking about sending to Ukraine. We need tanks and we need artillery, first of all. From this perspective, I would say any sort of counteroffensive to retake Kherson city would be possible after receiving all of these armaments. It will take several months at least. 
you cannot be in the middle of an ongoing offensive and be depending on military equipment that hasn't even been pledged, let alone uh, sent to Ukraine, on its way to Ukraine. It's, that is not how you run an offensive. So they're admitting they did not have enough equipment. They did not have the right equipment to succeed. They're waiting for it. It's stuff that is not coming. The, the U.S., its allies, didn't even say they're going to send it. What does that tell you? That That is the Western media. That is a, an officer in Ukraine's military telling you this. Uh, Western military supplies to Ukraine are dwindling in both quantity and quality. They are sending less of everything. They are sending uh, uh, equipment that is subpar uh, for the capabilities Ukraine re requires on the battlefield. And so this is where Ukraine is realistically. Uh, like it or not, these are the facts. Uh, fighting is still taking place around Kherson, but just remember, there was fighting before the offensive was launched. There's going to be fighting after it failed. It has, has failed. There's still fighting. We'll have, just have to wait and see if these rumors of tens of thousands of more Ukrainian troops are true, and we'll have to see what, what they're going to do that is different than what this first wave or first several waves uh, has already done and failed doing. But don't, don't ever underestimate either side in this fight. And let's just wait and see what happens next. So for now, that is the update. If you thought this video was useful, please like and share. Think about subscribing. It's free to do. It helps my channel grow. If you're watching this on YouTube, please check the video description below for other places you can find and follow my work. I'm not on Twitter or Facebook. If you want to find me on social media, uh, I have my link to telegram which i update several times a day my videos are all backed up automatically on odyssey and rumble sometimes it takes a day or two for them to show up and if for any reason youtube censors me off of their platform i will continue uploading my videos directly to rumble and odyssey in the video description below are all of the links uh, to everything that i just referenced uh, as well as for ways you can help support my work. I do not monetize my YouTube videos. If, a, if an ad pops up, please feel free to skip it. It is not helping me in any way. If you want to support my work, uh, please do so through Buy Me A Coffee, through Patreon, and also through PayPal. And to everyone who has been, that is what makes this work possible. So thank you, and as always, thank you for watching.